the sun is shining, the birds are chirping, the bacon is sizzling. Welcome to the Daily Swole. Welcome everyone to episode 172 of The Daily Mother Swole. Welcome to The Bicep Show. Welcome to The Gain Train. Thank you for buying your ticket. And just so you know, we're not stopping till we get to Gainesville. We might stop a little bit briefly for lunch or for a snack in Jacksonville. And the last and final stop is Boston, Mass. So if you're in for the long haul, you got the one-way ticket on the Swole Train. Let's begin. Welcome to everyone joining me live on Facebook, on Periscope and Busker, all at Swole Normus and YouTube at Swole Normus. I got the card that I'm floating around. If you're watching live YouTube, you can check out my YouTube videos. And also on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher. This is a podcast, thus the microphone in my grill. Let's begin with no further ado. Episode 172, five ways to growing massive, massive biceps. And obviously I can talk from experience because my arms are large. And I haven't even done a lot of arms recently because as you know, I've been doing some more total body workouts, doing a deloading period. But biceps are are a trouble area for many people. So I am going to give you five ways that you can focus on in order to shock your arms into growth. Ah, Periscope. Periscope missed out on the gain train. So hold on, flex it up. There we go. That's one. And then that's two. Got some... Got some, got, got, some, got some good size there going there, guys. Got some good stuff. Some good stuff. <laughs> and, of course, triceps are a big part. But right now, we're just talking about biceps. Just talking about biceps because biceps specifically are a classic mirror muscle. But a lot of times, people have trouble building their biceps for a couple of reasons. And I'm going to go over some ways where you can wake them up. So... There are a couple ways to flex your elbow. Now, the complicated thing and the simple thing about biceps is that the bicep or the elbow joint, the bicep joint, the, the joint that the bicep crosses, the elbow joint really only does one thing. It flexes, it bends. The bicep muscle actually attaches onto the scapula and crosses the shoulder joint and the elbow joint. So the simplicity of the movement of the biceps, just seemingly just bending the elbow, that is what it seems like it's only doing, is a little bit more complex in order to get it to grow because the movement is so simple, you have to be more creative and you have to be more strategic in how you shock the muscle. There are certain specific ways that will target it and work it better and more in all encompassing ways because of its limited function. It doesn't go in all crazy different um positions. It does. It's not a long muscle. It's not a super strong muscle. It's one of those muscles that needs specific types of training. And of course, everyone's going to be a little bit different, but what's really going to keep you on a growth pattern, no matter, no matter what you choose, no matter what you find effective for your bicep growth is going to be keeping it healthy. And one of the major problems that people find when they train their biceps, they do a lot of arm training, is that they get elbow pain. They get um, you know, the pain on the inside of the elbow. You get golfer's elbow and you get tennis elbow on the outside. You get medial and or lateral epicondylitis. And I did an episode recently about decreasing your elbow pain using the Thera, the TheraBand uh, stick where you can decrease and strengthen your forearm muscles where you would greatly uh, de greatly decrease your risk for tendonitis and for inflammation around those uh, bony structures, those bony landmarks. The yeah, the TheraBand it, it's great. It, it's such a great method to decrease forearm pain. In addition, thanks, Brooke. I appreciate that. She said, uh, "So I'm so rad." So I'm so rad. I love that word. Are you from California? Rad's pretty popular still out in gnarly. You sound like a surfer. You sound like my kin. The bicep or the bicep or the elbow joint needs to be healthy. If you're getting injured, if you're getting hurt, if you're getting tendonitis, you can't even grip anything. You might not be able to, might not even be able to drive your car. You have to keep it behind your body. 
you gotta keep that center of gravity back. So what I want you to do when you're doing your bicep curls is to almost do a drag curl, to drag your elbows back behind you. It's hard to see, you can't see it on YouTube, you can barely see it on Facebook Live or Periscope, but when you curl up, instead of bringing your elbows forward, you're going to curl and pull your elbows back behind you. That takes the actual, the leverage and the angular force off of the tendon and off the insertion, similar to the exercise video. It's actually not so, it's exactly like the exercise video that I posted on my YouTube channel. So again, I'm gonna flash this up if you haven't seen my YouTube channel, YouTube Swolnormous. You have to check out this video. It's the 90 degree triceps extension. I talk about this, how I drag my elbows out to the side and drag them down by the sides of my body to decrease tension on the elbow joint from that angle. Same thing with the biceps. You pull the elbows back and that takes pressure off the tendinous insertion onto, that inserts onto the forearm and the radius and the ulna. So that function, that form is going to keep you healthier. It's gonna decrease the risk of inflammation. And like anything else, you wanna see progress, you have to keep on working, and if you're injured, you're not working, you're going backwards or you're staying stagnant. So make sure you keep that. It doesn't mean it happens, it has to happen all the time. This is especially important if you're at risk, if you're someone that's at risk for elbow pain. Another thing, when you're doing your curls, keeping your fingernails up towards the ceiling. Don't curl the wrist. When you're doing curls, don't bend your wrist because then you are putting more tension on your forearm flexors and you're gonna tighten those up and you're at more risk for creating an imbalance around the elbow joint, creating more pain and more inflammation, more tendonitis. Number two, a variety of angles for this very simple muscle. The biceps, are two, oh, thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks for the thanks for the feedback, Herc. There are two parts of the bicep, that's why it's called biceps by two. The origin on the shoulder, crossing the shoulder joint, and inserting onto the forearm, the actual, the ulna, so um, in, in effect, makes the biceps a two-joint muscle. Now, most of you, if not all of you, didn't know that that the biceps work when you're raising your arm up. They do forearm flex or shoulder flexion as well. This is even more important, the next point that I'm gonna make. The starting angle and the starting position for your biceps. The different angles, whether you curl with your arms out to the side, with your arm in, whether you do a preacher curl with your arm forward, this is going to blend a little bit into number three, which is starting stress and stretch points. The variety of angles is still gonna be important, even though the biceps, the muscle, is very simple and performs oh, simply some elbow or shoulder flexion and elbow flexion. Where that humerus is rotated, whether it's twisted, whether it's starting in a more flexed or an extended position, is going to put different mechanical stress on the muscle no matter where the stretch point start is, which is my next point. Number three is the starting stress and stretch point for the muscle. So variety of angles, number two, and starting stress and stretch points, number three. This means incline curls. Lying back on a slight incline bench, let's say 80, 80 or 75 degrees lying back with your arms stretched out behind you where the muscle is super stretched to start, or a preacher curl where you're sitting and your arms are over that little pad or the edge or the top of a bench curling forward and the muscle is starting in a little more of a shortened position. These are all different ways where you can change the initial stress and the arc of force on the biceps. I talked about this in my premium meeting, my accountability meeting yesterday, talking about creating variety in a simple atmosphere. You don't have to do crazy, crazy shakeups and do completely different workouts. You don't have to do running and lunges one day and then, oh, let me do heavy, heavy squats and chest press the next day. And the next day I gotta do cycling for 100 miles and, and do 1,000 pushups. You don't have to do mind-blowing, black and white, yin-yang type of variety to see results. Little tweaks, little tweaks here and there are enough. Just taking the same exercise, the same amount of reps and sets, just tweaking the order or the pace or the rest periods between each exercise or each set is going to be enough to create a difference in the body, a different stimulus. So when you have the biceps, just changing the angle of the starting position, you can keep the same exercises. You have a simple muscle that just does meh. 
It does that. So how are you going to do it differently? You're going to rotate the arm into start. You're going to let the arm hang behind you and stay stretched. You're going to hang with the arms forward. You're going to use a cable so there's constant tension. You're going to use a band and pull your elbows back. You're going to do an external rotation with the curl and then internally rotate your arms after. You're going to keep your thumbs facing up and doing a hammer curl. That way you don't get the full extension or the full contraction of the muscle uh, instead of supinating the forearms and turning your, your wrists upwards when you do the curl. There are so many different ways to subtly tweak this muscle and a lot of people don't do enough starting stretch points and starting stretch points differently than just a standard standing up and curling. If you're just standing up and you're curling, the muscle is going from like a just a regular moderate position generating some force. You might be swinging a little bit to get the weight up and then it's contracted, not even completely. And then you let it back down, back to a neutral position. If you go on an incline bench, let's say in 80 degrees and you're lying back a little bit, your arms hanging back behind you, you're getting a much, much greater stretch on the muscle to start. You're putting in a much weaker position to begin and you're going to target and cause micro trauma in the muscle a lot differently. You're not gonna be able to lift as much weight. Now, here's the thing. Here's where the ego comes in. A lot of people don't do these exercises because, wow, if I do incline curls, I'm going to have to drop the weight to 15 pounds. Normally, when I stand, I curl 30s. I'm going to have to drop it to 20s. And most people think that going down in weight is a negative, is a, is a detriment, or you're losing, you know, you don't want to see a lower, especially as a guy. Most guys don't want to look, and girls too, most people don't want to look at a weight and see a lower number. Oh my God, that's less. I'm going back. I'm getting weaker. I'm not seeing as much progress. You know, they're just embarrassed for themselves or, um, you know, they would rather stand and lift a 30 or a 40 than sit down and lift a, a 20. But here's the thing. The reason why you can't lift as much is because the muscles in a weaker position. And the goal of bodybuilding is to bring up every weak muscle to be a strong point. Now, when you have a muscle that's weaker in certain positions and certain ranges of motion, there are certain stretching or stretch positions that where the muscle starts where it's too lengthened, the muscle is actually weaker. It's mechanically weaker. It's mechanically disadvantaged position. But that's good because you're going to stress the muscle in a new way. You don't need as much weight because the muscle is physically and biomechanically weaker from a more extended position. There are certain optimal starting lengths where the muscle can produce the most force, but you can also manipulate those starting lengths and overload the muscle in new ways, create microtrauma that will trigger growth in the muscle tissue, and with proper diet, rest, blah, 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 consistency, you're going to see growth. So do not brush off exercise that you might be a little bit weaker in. It's not all about more weight. It's not all about more weight. It's about creating trauma in the muscle that the body is going to have to adapt and respond to. And if you're not creating any new force and if you're not shocking it into needing to adapt, you're not going to see any more change. You're going to be stagnant. And you're not going to have those results that I'm talking about. And that's why you're watching. Number four, concentration, focus, concentration. You need to squeeze. You need to squeeze. You need to keep constant pressure, and when you're at full contraction, you need to squeeze. So if you're in the mirror and you're squeezing, you're flexing, when I do the, like, you know, the daily mother swole, and I reach up and I squeeze my biceps, I create that tension, I flex, so to speak, that's what you have to do when you're, when you're working out. When you're doing your set, you have to squeeze, and I want you to try to pump all the blood into the bicep every time you squeeze. I want you to picture that you're cracking a walnut between your bicep and your forearm every time you, every time you curl. There's a reason why that exercise is called concentration curls is because you look like that statue, the thinker, and your head is down, so it looks like you're thinking really hard, you're concentrating. But at the same time, it's a very effective exercise because first off, you're in a great position to spot yourself, and you're also focusing on the contraction 110%. You are focusing on getting every fiber completely tensed out during that movement. Never underestimate how important it is to squeeze hard while you're lifting. It's not about that weight going up and down. That's great. But if you're not focusing on squeezing that muscle, that bicep muscle, 100%, you're going to be getting some forearm muscles. You're going to be getting some other assisting muscles and maybe a little bit of a lean. You're going to cheat a little bit. You're not going to be getting all activation on the biceps, and that is going to pretty much, I wouldn't say negate, but it's going to cripple your ability to maximize the activity on the bicep and you're just going to affect your ability to maximally benefit from that exercise. And the reason why we're in the gym, the reason why people don't see results and the reason why people don't work out effectively enough and they work out too long is because you're wasting your time doing things you don't need to do. You're not being as effective and as on point with 
things that you could be doing. It's not about how much you do sometimes, about how well you do it. Now, there are benefits to volume training with growing muscle, but that's for more advanced people. You don't need to go do in five, six sets per exercise. You need to do that exercise 100% for a couple sets. I'd, like I said before, I'd rather you do one or two sets to absolute beautiful failure than five sets sub failure. You need to start pushing yourself harder. Now, there are times when, okay, maybe going to failure could be too physiologically overloading, but at the same time, most of you are not even coming close to failure. So once you get to that point and you're going to failure all the time and you're really doing, then we can worry about that later, but you'll have massive results. So you're going to, uh, you're going to benefit more than you could ever imagine. So once you get more advanced and your body gets more stress, that's where that's going to come into play. And that's why I keep talking about yoga, because the mental stress that we're under all day long, every day, you need to create that kind of balance when you put yourself under that duress in the gym. But that's going to get a little bit too off topic. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for joining me. Welcome for a first timer on Facebook. I appreciate the support. Thank you for joining. Welcome, welcome. And the last one, eh, I said number five. This is going to be kind of uh, five and, and six. I'm going to add a little bonus one in there because I have something I want to add into this. You want to treat the biceps like a compound muscle, like a compound exercise. Now, a compound meaning multi-joint like a bench press, elbow and shoulder, like a squat, hip, ankle, knee, you know, thoracic and core stability. Those types of compound exercises, multi-joint movements, you can do a lot of overload. You can do a lot of negatives where we work on the eccentric motion, like eccentric, you know, push-ups, eccentric pull-ups, lowering motion. I've talked about that before. I'm not going to get into exactly that type of training. What I want to talk about is treating the biceps like that. This is more for more for advanced type training, intermediate and advanced. Things like the preacher curl, the one-arm preacher curl, I freaking love doing heavy negatives on the preacher curl. You got to be careful doing negatives on more single joint style muscles. And I said the bicep is a multi-joint muscle, but it's a very small, very small, you know, very small multi-joint muscle. It's not like a big muscle like uh, the quad, like the rectus femoris that crosses two joints. You know, it's a big, strong muscle, a little tiny muscle. So doing negatives, doing only the eccentric overload training, complete overload training, you got to be careful. One thing, for example, for the preacher curl, for the one arm preacher, is you want to be careful with the lowering motion, not going to complete extension. That's one of the things that you can do when you're doing, let's say, negatives with biceps, doing a, a barbell. And I'm going to show a lot of these exercises, a lot of these styles on my YouTube channel. There's a lot of exercises coming up, so stay tuned for more of those voiceovers. But treating the biceps sparingly more like a compound body part, like a movement, doing heavy negatives, doing extremely heavy weight is important to shock them. You cannot just treat the biceps like a dainty little small muscle and just do high reps all the time and do lightweight. You have to push it. You have to go to overload. You have to go to failure. A great way to do this is with a barbell in the squat rack or with a cable curl. And what you do is you put the bar at the top, like about, you know, chest level, you get under it, you hold it up, you back up a little bit and you keep your elbows back and you slowly drag it down doing the negative put it down on the rack, squat down, lift it up, put it back on the rack, and then lift it again, and then only do the negative. So an eccentric and overload exercise or movement is a movement you can only do while the muscle is lengthening, while you're doing decelerating the weight with gravity. So the lowering movement of a curl, the lowering movement of a push-up, the lowering movement of a pull-up, where you're working the same muscles, but you're working the muscles in their stronger range of motion, which is while they're lengthening. So this is a way where you can shock the muscle into growth. Be careful with doing overload and eccentric training with biceps. You will be effing absolutely blasted sore the first time you do it. Don't do too much. Trust me, you're going to you're, you're going to flatten yourself. You're going to flatten yourself. Come to Cali and shoot me a few. You're in California? Damn, when did you move out there, bro? We're going to have to catch up. And number six, I said, I said five in the title, but guess what? If you watch this episode and you listen to this episode, you're going to get a bonus one. So I'm still going to title it five, but you know, maybe I'll add, eh, maybe I'll add six. Maybe I'll call it six because you deserve it. You deserve it. You've been with me this whole time. Let's talk about number six. Let's talk about another one. Frequency. Biceps is a small muscle. The biceps brachii is a smaller muscle. This is is going to be something that you can think about and you can try depending on your experience, depending on your workout schedule, your workout schedule capacity, how often you're able to train. It's a smaller muscle. You're able to work it more frequently. You might want to consider doing two bicep sessions a week, maybe three. 
Two is a great way to start. I wouldn't just jump from one to three, but here's what I do sometimes. I'll do arms on a separate day. This is a classic split for me, or I'll do, let's say, back and biceps on a different day. But that back and biceps day, let's say that's a Monday or a Tuesday, I'll do back, and then I'll do, let's say, nine or 10 higher rep, short rest, you know, bicep, you know, let's say cable curls or bicep curl or dumbbell curls, just for like a pump. I'll do high rep, short rest, and I'll just pump, 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 and just kind of get like a, the blood flowing, get a good pump, but lightweight, not, you know, kind of to failure, but 10, 15 reps to pretty much failure and just do like five, six, maybe 10 sets, one after the other of a lighter weight just to actually just flush the bicep full of blood. And then later on in the week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I crush it with a heavier, more intense bicep, tricep workout. So I kind of used it like a pump, and then I'll do like a heavier weight. And that worked for me for a long time, and that's something I'll probably gravitate back into because I love doing bicep and tricep. But during the rest of the week, I felt like they were getting a little flat, like they could get more activity, they can get some more action, I could do some more work for them, but I didn't want to do two heavy workouts a week. So I did one lighter pump workout with a synergistic body part like a bi- like the back. So I did back and a bicep pump, and then I did chest and a tricep pump, and then later on the week I did heavier and more intense, more volume for biceps and triceps. So it's a smaller muscle, so it's generally going to recover quicker. Make sure you stretch. You can still foam roll your biceps. You can still roll it over a bar. You know those pads for the neck that you can put for squats? You can also put that on the bar, one of those bars that roll, let's say like on a Smith, and you can put one of those pads and roll your bicep on it. You can even roll it on the bar itself if you're a gangster and you don't mind uh, internally bleeding or that feeling of extreme pain, but you can roll that way too or get deep tissue massage, whatever your preference is. But it's still a muscle. Treat it with respect, but it is smaller, so it can have the potential to recover quicker, and everyone's different with that. Just make sure you're eating properly, you're resting properly, and you're hydrating properly. Okay? This has been five or six ways to growing massive biceps, different ways to think about training. You have to be consistent. No matter what, you have to be safe. If you're getting hurt, that number one, keeping the elbows back behind you, you have to keep it safe. So find the episode, ooh, what is that? I think it's like within the last five or 10, it's how to cure forearm pain. Look up that TheraBand, that rubber stick that is going to help balance your forearm muscles where you don't get that golfer's elbow and tennis elbow that's going to help keep you healthy in order to continuously, continuously train and see progress. Thank you for joining me for episode 172 of The Daily Mother Swole. Stay for a couple minutes after on Periscope and or Facebook. I'll take a few questions after I officially punch off. Remember, check out and share that video one minute for the rest of your life on my Facebook page. It's doing really, really well. Everyone's sharing that like crazy. It's a great message. So thank you, thank you, thank you for moving that around. If you have already shared it, I appreciate that more than I can explain. Uh, thank you for joining me live on Facebook, Periscope, and Busker, YouTube at Swolnormous, and also SoundCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher. Thank you for joining me for episode 172 of The Daily Mother Swole. I will see you tomorrow, 12 noon Eastern time, for episode 172. Three. You can also find me on Snapchat, on Instagram, and all those sexy places where you can get in contact with me if you got any questions. So I will catch you on the flip side. Peace out. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday.